Back in the early 2010s, I was living in Leicester, a small town somewhere in England, the exact position of which has been lost to geographers. Now, if I wanted to visit my family on the continent, I would have to take a bus from Lice Easter all the way to Heathrow Airport and venture into the now forgotten depths of what used to be called Terminal 1. Then Terminal 2 opened up in 2014-ish, and my usual airline moved all of its flights over to that one. I still remember one of my first visits to the new terminal, sitting outside the shops in the departure area and thinking, Wow! This show looks a lot like the hit video game entertainment product Deus Ex Human Revolution. Now, you have to understand that this space was quite different to what I was used to seeing in airport terminals. The centerpiece was this huge wireframe structure lined with LED lights. The shops had LCD panels for signs. In fact, screens were everywhere. The whole place felt animated and high-tech in a way that reminded me more of fictional environment design than real-world interiors. And my mind went to Deus Ex, not because as a gamer I had no other meaningful frame of reference and also shut up, but because among fiction, human revolution seems uniquely suited to these kinds of comparisons. I think this game often doesn't get enough credit for how influential it was. For one, it did a lot to revive and modernize the long-abandoned immersive sim genre, paving the way for some of the best games in recent memory. But even outside of games, Human Revolution is one of those works of science fiction that I believe has, if not directly inspired, then at the very least successfully predicted many of the trends in design and tech in the years that followed it. Like, for example, how its idea of what public spaces might look like somehow found its way into London's airport terminals just a few years later. See, Deus Ex can be broadly categorized as a work of cyberpunk. And as a work of cyberpunk, it comes preloaded with some very specific tropes that often accidentally facilitate these sorts of predictions. The genre draws from a set of tools and methods that allow it to project itself Do you get it? into our world in a way that very few other genres can. And it's this tool set that I'm going to talk about in this year's video. I'm going to start making these more often one day, I swear. So, welcome, grab a drink, get comfortable and get ready for a dive into the fascinating world of... Hang on. Speculative design. Wait, this isn't about Deus Ex. This isn't about video games at all. Who wrote this? You wrote it. Well, oh. This is Uninvited Guests, a short film by Superflux. It follows an elderly gentleman whose caring family replaced all of his stuff with Internet of Things enabled nightmare surveillance trash in order to make sure he stays healthy and exercises. But he's having none of that nonsense. Hi Jinx and Sue. There is a link in the description if you would like to watch it for yourself. It's less than five minutes long and it's genuinely quite funny and well put together. It is a delightful little shitpost made by a prominent and well-respected design studio. It is also one of the better known examples of what we call speculative design. Okay, side note, uh, there's a good chance that this video is going to end up a bit thicker with academic design jargon than I would like. So for those of you not in the know, speculative design is when you do design that's speculative. There, I'm sure that clears it all up. The term gets thrown around often enough that most of you will have probably come across it at some point, but I would be surprised if many of you are all that familiar with the actual practice. And that's because the actual practice is kind of a complicated mess that often seems like it has very little to do with um, design, or at least what most people understand design to be. For one, unlike a lot of design, it isn't all that concerned with creating tangible artifacts. Now, don't worry, the kinds of things that are more traditionally seen as design outcomes still get made. A work of speculative design can still contain bits and pieces of graphic design, or film, or a bunch of diegetic prototypes. You see, diegetic prototypes are prototypes that are diegetic. Take, for example, uninvited guests. The work itself takes the form of a short film set in the future. Its premise revolves around a set of designerly objects that exist within its fiction. Oh yeah, I get it! In this case, a set of everyday objects converted into high-tech connected devices made to monitor how they're being used. 
These are all very tangible design outcomes and are important in their own right, but they're not the focal point of the work. Their role is to facilitate the world building, and it is this world building itself that the bulk of the work went into. The main design outcome of a speculative design is the speculation itself. So maybe a better way to describe speculative design is as the process of designing speculative futures. Ooh, futures. How exciting. I like it, let's work with that. And you know, for what is essentially an overcomplicated system of making shit up, it's actually a fascinating process. It leans heavily into a designer's understanding of user psychology, their familiarity with ethnography and sociology, skills that you may not expect designers to have, but they do tend to drive a whole lot of mainstream design research these days. And it directs these skills to create the fictional context for placing all these fun futuristic designs into. It's a serious academic endeavour. This man tried to live as a goat. And it's the process that, in a big part, defines the work of speculative design. It's also what differentiates uninvited guests from, say, an ad for connected appliances. Because the designers understand the actual needs of the protagonist, they can create a set of diegetic prototypes that clash against those needs. The intended purpose of these IoT horrors gets undermined almost immediately as the character finds ways to work around their basic functionality. As product design, these things would be pretty spectacular failures. But, crucially, these failed fictional designs weren't just pulled out of a designer's orifice. They were extrapolated from clear current trends in tech and product development. The prototypes are not just plausible, but in terms of our immediate future, very likely. It's almost as if uninvited guests was trying to get across some kind of a point to prompt its audience into thinking critically about an existing aspect of our society and the kind of a future we may be heading towards. But you don't care about critical thinking, let's get back to the exciting future stuff. So at this point you might be looking at the fairly grounded near future bordering on present of uninvited guests and asking yourself what, for the purposes of speculation, even qualifies as a future? And that's an excellent question. Here's a graph. Did I say this stuff was exciting? Okay, so first of all, these funny triangles aren't actually triangles, they're concentric cones projected from the side. Look, I didn't make this up, this is entirely the fault of futurologist Stuart Candy, blame him. So this point here is the present, which spreads out into a functionally infinite number of possible future scenarios, from the most outlandish and far-fetched here on the outskirts, through the more plausible stuff as you go in, all the way to the most likely future projections here in the middle. The idea is that everything inside the diagram is fair game for speculation, everything outside is basically fantasy. There's also this extra cone for futures that are good and that some people might even want to live in, but you can safely ignore that. So with all this in mind, I want you to try and imagine what you think might be a likely future scenario. Knowing what you know about the world today, I want you to try to create a vision in your head of what you think the world might look like and say, 30 to 50 years. Try to focus on the cool and exciting stuff, you know, the look and the feel, the colour and the texture of the world. Anything goes really, as long as you can draw a clear line between where we are now and the world you are imagining. Oh wait, got it? Now, are you thinking of neon signs and angular shapes, pristine technology contrasting with poverty and dilapidation, all set in the landscape ravaged by a collapsing climate? Congratulations, you have imagined the present, now try again. Wait, no, I'm doing the critical thing again, just ignore that. Also, if the world you have imagined wasn't cyberpunk, I'm going to have to ask you to just play along here. We're looking at cool futures now. So, cyberpunk then. I'm willing to bet that the majority of you have defaulted to it, and yes, I know that's a pretty bold assumption on my part, but I have a good reason for making it. Cyberpunk is easily the most widespread and accessible vision of the future we have, one that has left a mark on our collective cultural imagination. It has also been enjoying a resurgence in popularity of late, as the aesthetic appeal of its particular brand of late 80s retro future has wormed its way into the zeitgeist once again. Cyberpunk is big right now. I wasn't kidding when I said that particular version of the future was de facto the present. Everyone's kind of vibing with the look of it. The fashion world has been looking towards it for inspiration. Glitches and neon colors feature on lists of graphic design trends. I hear there was even a cyberpunk video game that came out or something. What was it called again? Oh yeah, Deus Ex, Human Revolution. 
So, Human Revolution is set in the far away future of 2027. What? Wait, when did this come out again? 2011. Christ, I promise one day I'll talk about a game that isn't over a decade old, but today is not that day. Anyway, Human Revolution is set in the faraway future of 2027 in a version of our world where human augmentation, a replacement of healthy body parts with cybernetic modifications, has become common practice. As far as world building goes, you probably already have a very good idea of where this is going. We're looking at city landscapes dominated by advertising, mechanical limbs on everyone, trench coats and sunglasses galore. Deus Ex certainly puts a unique spin on the cyberpunk aesthetic, one that sets it apart from a lot of the more archetypal examples of the genre. Your Blade Runners, your Shadow Runs, your Matrices. Actually, maybe not the Matrices. Your Ghosts in the Shell. Ghosts in the Shells? Ghosts in... Even if many of those differences are fairly surface level, for the most part it boils down to less neon and more yellow. But it does approach its aesthetic choices with a level of style and confidence that really help sell the scene it's painting. Which, for my purposes, makes it into a really good representative sample to talk about the kind of uncannily plausible future projections that works of cyberpunk are capable of creating. It does all the cool and exciting future stuff, you could say. And I think a lot of that is the result of just how grounded the game feels in its presentation. Right off the bat, it just seems more imminently real than most sci-fi worlds I can think of. Everything from fashion to architecture, from diegetic mass media to graphic design, has an air of casual believability to it that I really don't think we see very often in science fiction while also managing to be quite striking at times. Okay fine, I guess I don't really buy that China will build an entire city on top of another city within the next half decade but that's logistics. The aesthetic ended up being so spot on that maybe a year or two later some designer at Logitech put it on my computer mouse. And then, later still, large urban spaces like, say, airport terminals started mimicking it. And, of course, there's this guillotine on wheels, which I can only assume is setting up some kind of dramatic irony for when Elon Musk gets run over by one. Look, I'm all for unconventional aesthetics, but this thing seems primarily designed to decapitate pedestrians and... Wait, what the fuck? Dad. What? Cool futures. <sighs> right. What I was trying to get at is that some designers somewhere at Idols Montreal had at some point in their life come across the cones. And the way they designed the exciting future world of human revolution didn't start in 2027. It started in 2011 and then worked its way to 2027 through a series of speculations. And now you're starting to see how speculative design is relevant, right? You can see why I wanted to talk about it. You've got this great set of tools for building futures, so of course storytellers are going to want to use them. We have a term for stories made this way, stories like Deus Ex and, well, most cyberpunk, that use speculation to craft believable worlds to use as their setting. They're called speculative fictions, a term which, unlike speculative design, probably rings a couple more bells for most of you. And I mean, of course it does, it's stories, everyone knows stories. The label speculative fiction even tends to get used interchangeably with science fiction. And I have axed an entire 10 minute chunk of this video entirely dedicated to splitting straws about what makes children of men different from Dune. But ultimately, those differences aren't all that relevant here. What is relevant is that we can even talk about these two in the same conversation without having to bother with splitting those straws in the first place. Because it's all stories, it's all made for the same audiences and for the same purpose, the purpose being entertainment. Which brings us to the reason why speculative design doesn't usually enter these same conversations and isn't as widely known outside of design circles, despite being pretty much the driving principle behind how speculative fictions give form to all their exciting future stuff. And it's not because there's some kind of a huge rift between the two, you could make a convincing case that there are in fact speculative designs within most speculative fictions, and that a lot of speculative designs do take the form of fictional stories. The big distinction is that the purpose of speculative fictions is usually entertainment, and the purpose of speculative design is... It now occurs to me that I haven't actually told you that yet. Let's fix that now. 
So here's about the least obscure example I could come up with. This is the sort of outputs you are most likely to come across if you're looking for real life users of speculative design in context. It's called a future vision. Microsoft, as well as I guess most large tech companies, tend to make these every now and then as a visualization of the company's best stab at the kind of future their product strategy may be looking towards. It uses the toolset of speculative design to design speculative products. Products that may not be possible with the currently available technology, but nevertheless represent the direction the company might want to steer itself into. Microsoft is here doing a thing called visioning. It's the same kind of a thought exercise that I made you do earlier for a cheap joke, and the specific vision that they're coming up with is one in which technology actually solves the world's problems. Their future is sleek, shiny and appealing. So the purpose of speculative design is corporate marketing. Just like all design. I bet you were expecting something a bit more glamorous. Maybe this is why no one gives a shit about design anymore. But that's what you wanted, right? You wanted the exciting future stuff. You wanted the cool sci-fi shit with neon colors and bomber jackets, the mechanical limbs and the glass interfaces. You wanted the aesthetics. No? You're sure? All right then, let's talk about criticality. Victimless Leather by Symbiotica was a project curated for New York's Museum of Modern Art in 2008. The exhibit was a vat containing a sample of living tissue growing into the shape of a jacket. The artists behind it aimed to provoke conversations about the kinds of responsibility we may or may not have towards products made from living things and what happens to that dynamic when the product itself is alive. A wonderfully pretentious premise that took a much more interesting turn when the tissue started growing out of control and the curators ended up having to use euthanize it. Yes, this did prompt headlines about the museum killing an exhibit. Yes, this does mean that it's technically possible to kill art, and yes, the ethical implications of this on the future of art curation are extremely fun to think about. Yes Men are an American group of comedy activists consisting of Jack Servin and Igor Bamus. Throughout their long career, they have played some very high-profile pranks in the world's corporate elite, going to great lengths to expose the hypocrisies of the belief systems driving much of modern politics and highlight the damage being done to real human people in the process. One of their more infamous projects was a speculative issue of the New York Times that they handed out in front of the New York Times offices, much to the dismay of the real New York Times. The paper was full of extremely fake, but also extremely good and extremely plausible news, detailing policy decisions like like, say, ending the Iraq war, that there was no real political will for despite their overwhelming popularity. Like a window into a self-evidently better world, a reminder about just how absurd all the daily news trash that we somehow still have to deal with more than a decade later is. This is too good to be true, <laughs> but it's not impossible. They also made this wonderful nonsense and tricked some rich prick into putting it on. It's, it's great, they're great, you should follow their work if you don't already. Mitigation of Shock by Superflux was an apartment in London that existed as a look into the future where having to deal with the disastrous consequences of the impending climate collapse has become a part of people's daily lives. It highlights the unsettling mundanity that follows in the wake of catastrophe, the capacity we have to normalize exceptional circumstances and to continue on with our daily lives as if nothing had happened in a world where nothing can truly go back to normal. The project seems almost prophetic in light of what all of us had to go through in the last two years, while also serving as a stark reminder that the worst is yet to come. And speaking of Superflux, oh look, it's Uninvited Guests again, a project that's all about the hubris of the Silicon Valley bubble and its inability to understand or even care about the actual human needs that are supposed to be driving their product development. It's about the unrelenting focus on chasing trends, on developing new technologies just so they're developing something, on finding high-tech solutions to problems that don't exist. And it's about just how overwhelmingly the need for human-centered intervention trumps innovation for the sake of innovation and in product design. You see, human-centered design is design that's centered around humans. You don't have to worry about it too much though, it's mostly to do with teapots. Not all of these are speculative design projects, but what they all have in common is that they ask difficult questions. They point out the things no one really wants to think about, the mundane realities that aren't exciting or glamorous, but are dissonant. 
They look at specific aspects of how the world operates, uncomfortable realities that we accept even though they contradict our stated values simply because accepting them is often more convenient, and they encourage the audiences to engage critically with the possible futures that they present. But Jan, I hear you call out, despair mounting in your increasingly confused voice. You keep going on about this criticality business, but what does that even mean? Well, I'm glad you ask. Here's a chart. If you have walked past an art school at any point in the last two decades, there's a good chance you've seen this. It's called the AB Manifesto, and it was drawn up by Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby, a pair of speculative designers whose practice emerged from the Royal College of Art in London. Dunn and Raby, apart from being the people who defined and popularised speculative design as we know it today, are also one of those double acts that seem to come up every time an academic designer starts talking. They also always seem to be brought up in tandem like they're one person, a bit like Jesse and James or Ornstein and Smoth. I guess that makes speculative practice the dark soul design. With the AB Manifesto, Dunn and Raby defined their idea of where they wanted their emerging speculative practice to go. They came up with a set of values, a loose collection of goals and attitudes that would form an alternative to better established modern commercial design practices. That's your key to understanding this semi-random jumble of words that you're looking at. You have the values and goals of affirmative design in column A contrasted against the values and goals of what Dunn and Raby called critical design in column B. When people encounter the term critical design for the first time, they often assume it has something to do with critical theory and the Frankfurt School or just plain criticism, but it's neither. We're more interested in critical thinking, that is, not taking things for granted, being skeptical, and always questioning what's given. All good design is critical. Dunn and Raby didn't invent criticality. In fact, what they call critical design has been adapted from various design practices that can be traced back for nearly a century. But they have made these ideas so central to their own practice that critical and speculative design have since become almost synonymous. It turns out that to the very people who codified speculative design as a fully formed practice, criticality was crucial. It's what set their work apart from most mainstream commercial design. It's what defined the identity and purpose of speculative design in the first place. Which circles us back to the question of what is speculative design even for? If it wasn't made as a marketing tool to begin with, then what is it? Conceptually, it responded to a particular time. It emerged really into mainstream design in about after the 2008 financial crisis, um, when a lot of people in the creative field were looking around for alternative ways of thinking. There was, of course, the Occupy movement. There was the Yes Men going into full stride and trying to sort of tackle corporate greed and things like that. And so this was a branch of design that appeared to be rejecting many of the notions of design as uh, something that just uh, creates desire, creates um, products, creates luxury, creates aspirations. It's, you know, it's, it follows a long tradition of radical design through the 20th century, rejecting the core notions of design. This version of design, particularly the critical element, that question what design was doing in the first place and its responsibility as a creator of futures and aspirations. This is Tobias Revel, a lecturer at the London College of Communication, an academic designer and my former tutor. Tobias has co-founded a bunch of smaller design studios, including Strange Telemetry, a practice specialised in speculative design, and is an alumnus of LCA's Design Interactions course, which makes him one of Dun & Raby's former students. In other words, Tobias is way more qualified to talk about speculative design than I'll ever be, and I have managed to trick him into a series of interviews. The speculative design is primarily aimed at a specific audience of people, whether that is people involved in a certain technology or a certain business or a certain set of policy decisions, to get them to think in a different way about those decisions. They do a lot of stuff with local government organisations, some small NGOs and occasionally with corporate organisations who are either developing strategies for 10, 15, 20 year time horizons and want new ways of thinking about those strategies that aren't just based off spreadsheets and data, but are maybe coming at things from a more experiential angle, like what will it feel like to live 20 years from now? Or they are developing services, so they're developing things like what's the future of 
elderly healthcare in 2050 and what how might the world change and again it's not about just looking at the data because the data is abundant it's looking at what it will feel like and trying to humanize the data through design because that's what design can do it can take data and turn it into a story that we can use to develop stronger um, qualitative research that we can then use to make better decisions and hopefully more empathetic decisions. Another way of thinking about this is speculative design is a research tool. Of course, this doesn't mean that speculative design should replace data-driven decision-making. Rather, it serves to complement it. Much like how the critical design column in the AB manifesto was never meant to replace established affirmative design practices. I think that, that manifesto is often slightly misread in that I don't think it was ever meant to be like you're either in A or you're either in B. The point of it, as I've always read it and as I've always taught it, is that it wasn't about saying you're either here or you're there, you're with us or against us, because that's just too binary and that doesn't make sense for the way that critical thinking works, which is that there's lots of nuance and complexity. What that is, is it, it is it an acknowledgement that design has politics. In a 2020 statement in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, our Talsorian Games have quoted its founder and the creator of the cyberpunk tabletop RPG as saying, Cyberpunk was a warning, not an aspiration. I don't think I need to tell you that as a genre, cyberpunk is more than a little bit political. Even if you aren't familiar with it, the word punk should be a dead giveaway. Cyberpunk worlds are by necessity dystopian. They are defined by corporate rule, civil unrest and wealth inequality. Works of cyberpunk made in the 80s were a projection of the political and socio-economic developments of the era into a speculative version of what has since become the present. They were a warning, and not just any warning, they were a warning against a specific set of policy decisions made under a specific economic model. Cyberpunk is, by definition, anti-capitalist. It is now easier to imagine the end of the world than an alternative to capitalism has been a fairly popular quote lately. It sometimes gets attributed to Dunn and Raby, who in turn attributed it to Frederick Jameson, who attributed it to someone. Except it also gets attributed to Mark Fisher, who attributed it to Jameson and Slavoj Žižek. Look, it doesn't matter who made it up, it's everyone's quote now, it has been socialised. But Dunn and Raby did use it, in fact it's the quote with which they opened the book Speculative Everything, which shouldn't come as much of a surprise given that speculative design is in the business of imagining alternatives. With the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the end of the Cold War, the possibility of other ways of being and alternative models for society collapsed as well. Market-led capitalism had won and reality instantly shrank, becoming one-dimensional. There was no longer other societal or political possibilities beyond capitalism for design to align itself with, as Margaret Thatcher famously said, there is no alternative. Yet, alternatives are exactly what we need. We need to dream new dreams for the 21st century, as those of the 20th century rapidly fade. So, does this mean that speculative design positions itself as anti-capitalist the same way cyberpunk does? Not quite. See, when Tobias said that design has politics, he didn't necessarily mean that every piece of design has an explicit political message that it wants to convey. Some, like many works of cyberpunk, do, but what a statement like this means is a lot more nuanced and a little bit more universal. Design has politics and you can change those politics. It's just saying that there are relative positions and that you as a designer have to get over the kind of mythological notion that the designer is somehow neutral. It's a part of a critical understanding that the world, the material world, the material culture is embedded with the biases of the designers in the first place. For a piece of design to be meaningfully critical, it needs to challenge its own notions of the world and engage critically with ideas that we're used to taking for granted. It doesn't need to be explicitly political, it doesn't need to promote any one worldview or a set of policies. It just needs to be able to understand and engage with its own ingrained bias to acknowledge that design has and will always have politics, intentional or not. In a similar vein, speculative design does not need to be anti-capitalist, but a work of speculation would kneecap itself if it was allowed to presuppose capitalism to uncritically treat it as the full extent of reality encompassing all possibilities for the future. So with all this in mind, let's take a look back at Deus Ex. I didn't just pick it as a case study because of its frankly impressive speculative aesthetics. It's because Human Revolution, as a piece of speculative fiction and as a work of cyberpunk, is deeply and often explicitly political. 
One of the trailers released as a part of the game's marketing campaign is a good example of this. It was styled as a propaganda documentary by Purity First, a group of anti-augmentation zealots that feature prominently in the game's story. The trailer, despite some cheesy melodrama, manages to do an excellent job of outlining the political conflict at the core of the story, introducing the major players, and narrowing down the flavour of this particular cyberpunk dystopia, and what's so dystopian about it. Namely, the unrelenting pressure its inhabitants face to replace their working body parts with cybernetic augmentations, and the unaccountable corporations in charge of that process. It also introduces by far my favourite bit of the game's world building, neuropazine, the drug that stops your average cyborg's immune system from attacking the hunks of plastic and metal embedded in their squishy bits. Now then, imagine you are a narrative designer working on Deus Ex, and you've just come up with Neuropazine. Your work is basically done for the day, so to celebrate, you get up from your cubicle and you go have a well-deserved shit during working hours. You sit down on the toilet and your mind starts racing. You start to realise that the fictional drug will have some pretty hefty implications on the game setting. Like, for example, is the drug reliance for life? If so, what happens to you if you suddenly lose access to it? How accessible is it in the first place? Does the company that produces it have a patent? If so, does that mean they have the market cornered? Can they just price the drug however they like, effectively holding every augmented person hostage? What does that mean, in a world that's beginning to accept human augmentation as the norm, for your ownership of your own limbs? Stay out of the ladies' restroom. And the trailer asks all of these questions and more. For an ad, it's honestly an impressive effort. It really tries to push the speculative part of its speculative world building to critically engage with the implications of having the technology of 2027 exist within 2011's economic model. Unfortunately for Deus Ex, this trailer is also a way better piece of critical speculative design than anything in the actual game. There is a lot of strangely incoherent commentary present in Human Revolution that does a lot to deflect any attempt at criticality away from real-world issues, and instead lays into a number of abstract red herrings that, at best, don't have much of an analogue in the real world, and at worst give me ulcers with how disconnected from reality they can be. Let's start with Purity first, the organisation behind the trailer, I mean propaganda video. In the world of Deus Ex, Purity First is an activist group that opposes human augmentation. Cool, you'd kind of expect that, right? There are tons of ethical issues with augmentation as it is depicted here. Lots of very valid concerns about bodily autonomy, surveillance, healthcare, about the increasing pressure to augment that's forcing people who can't afford it to make a choice between being locked out of public life and potentially running out of money and having their bodies literally fall apart. Transhumanism itself is full of strange ideological pitfalls and can often get uncomfortably close to eugenics. So there are a lot of potential points of attack that a group like Purity First can exploit. Lots and lots of valid questions to ask, issues to point out, solutions to propose. This is the game's first big chance to start getting into some of that tasty criticality business and it has already put its best foot forward with that trailer. So which one of these issues do you think Purity First picks as its main focus? So it turns out that they just really hate augmented people because their flesh is impure. They're reactionaries! On reflection, I probably should have paid more attention to the name. Violent reactionaries too. The very first mission in the game is you resolving a hostage situation that they caused. And I know what you're thinking. Big deal, the devs can make any world they want, why couldn't these fictional activists be essentially just ableist monsters? And yes, you're right, the writers can define the sides in a fictional conflict in any way they wish. But remember, this is a game that wants to debate ideas to paint the picture of a clash between two sides of a complicated conversation and the sides it paints are on one hand a corporate entity with a disproportionate amount of power and influence pushing potentially harmful technologies and on the other a bunch of cyber racists. But wait, you might say, isn't there another, more prominent organisation in the game that takes up the anti-augmentation side of the conversation? And yes, there is Humanity Front, a much more moderate, public-facing group that seeks to regulate augmentation tech through policy. Well, let's hear what they have to say on the topic. All we've ever sought is regulation. Rules governing how the technology is developed and laws that ensure it's used for the good of society. So who gets to make those rules? Men with wisdom, strength and tenacity to know what's right. Without control, there's no room for freedom, only anarchy. You were a policeman once. 
You know the importance of order. Okay, wait, so, hang on. So, you think regulation is good because too much freedom is bad, but also only the worthiest of men get to decide what the regulation is, and you get to decide which men are worthy, and they all just so happen to be, uh, your friends? God, this guy sounds like a very confused objectivist's idea of a social democrat. Oh, his name is Bill Taggart. Yeah, yeah, that checks out. It doesn't help that the Humanity Front has also been secretly giving orders to Purity First, for which it is a front, uh, cute, has actively incited riots and staged incidents that helped escalate protests into violence because, as we all know, the police definitely need to be tricked into brutalizing protesters, and has been a key player in the conspiracy driving the plot. So that fair and balanced debate thing that the game wanted to do so badly is off to a rocky start and somehow it gets worse when it presents its take on the traditional cyberpunk class conflict. What we're treated to here is absolute choice. It is the fever dream of a Lib Dem supporter overdosed on bath salts. It's spectacularly incoherent. It turns a black character into a racist stereotype rooting through trash to show that poor people exist. Well. Yeah. Then promptly forgets about them entirely and turns its attention towards augmentation as a civil rights analogy. One that will become even more explicit and even more weird in the sequel. But the thing is, because of the barriers to entry into augmentation, the filthy trash rooting plebs are essentially unaffected by the game's main conflict. They are little more than set dressing. Instead, the victims of the system are the well-off middle managers, people that can afford to be augmented in the first place, who are driven into poverty because of neuropazine reliance, and then turned into cyber zombies because... I don't know, story shenanigans. I'm still trying to decipher this nonsense, and the biggest insult to both any form of a critical engagement with the particular flavour of hypercapitalism that allowed these strange injustices to happen, and to the legacy of cyberpunk as critical fiction, is that the corporations at the centre of it all aren't even the game's villains. Instead, it's the fucking Illuminati. It's why Jim, I mean Bill Taggart, wouldn't stop going on about control and freedom like it's Assassin's fucking creed. He's in on it, because Humanity Front is also a front for the Templars or something. But I'm going to say this again because it bears repeating. So the cause of the main conflict in this cyberpunk story is not the world's social, political or economic systems. No, those are fine, that's just how it's always been mate, don't even think about it. No, it's a conspiracy of a shadowy cabal of elites that secretly control the world. Look, this isn't a review. I'm not telling you the game is bad because of this. You can still have an interesting, well-told story with this setup, but it's a point at which the critical conversation about the technology at the center of it goes out the window. Rather than examining the tech within the context it's set in, rather than exploring how it can exacerbate issues that we are already dealing with, as well as the entirely novel issues it could plausibly bring to the table, Human Revolution looks at the powder keg that is corporate-backed human augmentation and asks, but what if a secret international conspiracy hacks everyone? I could go on, but in the end it comes down to this. Deus Ex commits the deadly sin of critical speculative fiction. It presupposes capitalism. Cyberpunk was a warning, not an aspiration. It was the warning against the human consequences of the economic model that the game takes for granted. The same consequences it attributes to the actions of a room full of people while sweeping the systemic critique inherent to its genre under the rug. It refuses to question, to challenge, to think critically about the political and economic forces driving its world, the very same forces driving our own. Stripped of criticality, all that its design fiction is left with is the affirmative design. It's an aspiration, not a warning. It's monochrome minimalism, angular shapes and wireframe statues lined with LEDs. It's Logitech mice, Heathrow Terminal 2 and the Cybertruck. The entire contribution of human revolution as a piece of speculation is its aesthetic. In the way that cyberpunk might be deployed in cinema or games, I wouldn't see it as anything more than just an aesthetic decision to develop familiarity with the subject. Cyberpunk, as, as the sort of Gibsonian construct of like a weird group of sci-fi dudes in the in the 1980s, was a different thing to cyberpunk now in the contemporary age where it's, it's kind of a retro thing. It's a retro futurism now, in the same way that Stranger Things is a retro futurism of the 80s. 
right? There's a kind of comfort in that familiarity. You know, cyberpunk is nostalgic. Sometimes I can't help but wonder if we place way too many expectations on a 40-year-old countercultural movement that has since been appropriated and thoroughly recuperated back into mainstream culture. Cyberpunk was created at a time where our collective futures were being shaped by the likes of Reagan and Thatcher. It came into being just before the end of the Cold War, where reality was about to collapse in on itself to only allow for one political and economic model. It was a warning against where the world was heading at the time, and now that we have arrived there, there isn't all that much left for Cyberpunk to do other than to repeat the same old outdated warnings. Warnings that have since become little more than prophecies of hindsight. Insight. And when those warnings no longer apply, when the critical edge of cyberpunk has dulled with age, all that's left is the aesthetic. So maybe it's unfair of me to expect a work of cyberpunk from 2011 to approach its subject matter with the same revolutionary zeal a work of cyberpunk from the 80s would. And it's definitely unfair of me to judge it by the standards of critical design, because for all the pieces of speculation scattered through it, Deus Ex isn't speculative design. Its purpose wasn't to critically examine the role of design in shaping human futures. It's at best a speculative fiction, an entertainment product. And it's very good at that. Maybe you didn't get this from how I've just spent half a chapter complaining about it, but I truly love Human Revolution. I love it as a game, and I love it as a proof of concept that is, in my mind, responsible for Arcane's prey being as goddamn good as it is. You know the code? Yeah, 0451. I also like Bioshock, by the way. It's not relevant here, but I just thought I'd point that out for the people who only read the titles of videos before yelling at me in the comments. But I still feel it is necessary to point out its shortcomings as a piece of critical design and to hope that future games like it do a better job of engaging with the same themes. Because when it comes to the future of critical speculation, fictions, to me, show more promise than any other form of speculative practice. The thing is, speculative design has a problem, and it's a big one, though. You might struggle to see it because, much like cyberpunk, speculative design is at the height of its popularity. It is undoubtedly a part of the canon of modern design. It has found its place in many large-scale ventures. It has thoroughly cemented its place in the industry. Much like cyberpunk, speculative design has found itself integrated into the mainstream, or at the very least, the design mainstream. And most of it is product future visions. It's shiny surfaces and glass interfaces. It's sleek, spotless futures scrubbed clean of real human issues, removed from the ugly complexity behind the scenes of its beautiful technology, stripped of anything resembling criticality. It's marketing, a familiar aesthetic repurposed as a means of selling products. Much like cyberpunk. Now, I'm not what you would call a speculative designer, but I have been working on this video on and off for almost two years, and I've had a passing familiarity with speculative practice for even longer than that. During my masters, it was a fairly big part of the curriculum, so you'd expect bits and pieces to rub off. And in all that time, I've noticed a trend of designers more invested than myself becoming increasingly disillusioned with the direction their field of study has been taking. Speculative design is dead. It has been used and abused, rebranded and exploited, mystified and glorified beyond repair. Well, the words of Francisco Laranjo in an article he wrote for the European educational project Speculative Edu, in which he decried the extent to which the practice had become divorced from its critical origins. Not everyone's view of the topic is quite as categorical, but he's far from being the only designer who has expressed similar concerns. There is a uh, imperative on the part of these organizations to continue business as normal because it makes them profit while putting in uh, an exciting radical new framework to make them seem innovative and fresh. So it is most cynical. Uh, speculative design is whitewashing for design, product and development innovation decisions that would have been made anyway. And so the element of criticality that was part of speculative design, which is about questioning and provoking, is removed in that discourse because it's just a way of propping up the existing decisions that have already been made. Remember the cones. So there's still the one that we didn't talk about, the one about preferable futures. There's also this extra cone for futures that are good and that some people might even want to live in, but you can safely ignore that. You might not remember it though, it tends to get ignored a lot. Unfortunately, it's also the one that's the most important to forming an understanding of speculative design as a critical practice. There's a question that's implied every time someone brings up a preferable futures cone, and that question is, 
preferable to whom? The answer is whoever is making the decisions that steer us towards any given future. Right now, as Dun and Raby put it, what's preferable is defined by the needs of industry and capital. And arguably, the role of speculative design was always to question that, to find futures preferable to more people and to more diverse groups of people. To engage with the needs, hopes and aspirations of those that have, to this day, not had the chance to shape their own futures. But right now, speculative design is used to prop up the needs of industry, to keep that preferable cone firmly where it is. And what's left outside of the corporate sphere, the truly critical, thought-provoking, boundary-pushing work that speculative designers are capable of, and still very much create, gets very little meaningful exposure. It tends to end up confined to universities and art galleries, largely out of reach of the people who aren't designers, the same people whose futures the practice wants to help shape, the ones whose imaginations and engagement are critical to its success. And that's a problem, because if you're trying to design a future for someone else, and you don't involve them in the process, then you're not really speculating anymore. You're just projecting. That was it. That was the entire point of me bringing a projector to set. I hope you appreciated the bad pun. There's a link to my Patreon page and It's a concern that's voiced by a lot of speculative designers. It got brought up more than any other topic in a talk held by Speculative EDU that I've attended earlier this year, and it's the one problem that they seem to find no convincing solution to. But here's a thought. You know what does get more exposure than speculative design? What is more accessible than postgraduate papers and gallery pieces? Fiction. Now, fiction isn't exactly divorced from the needs of industry, we're still talking about entertainment products here, and there's always the question of whether a piece of popular fiction with its reduced scope and the reliance on a handful of traditional story structures can even claim to be meaningfully critical. For the record, I think it can, and good fictions often are even the big, expensive, profitable ones. And I had a bunch of academic jargon to back this all up, but if I were to spring concepts like COGNITIVE ESTRANGEMENT on you now, no amount of bad puns would save this abomination of a video. So instead, let's just listen to someone who actually knows what they're talking about. Whether you think it's good or bad, or whether I think it's good or bad, one of the most lasting impacts that science fiction and film has had on discussions of technology and popular culture and, and in the design and innovation world is Minority Report. That has had an enormous impact. It's still in the popular press whenever someone develops a new interface. It's an okay film. It's pretty good. It's insane. It's Tom Cruise. It's got all the hallmarks and tropes of a good hero narrative. You know, there's an arc of redemption and everything like that. Would it have been as effective as a analogous device in discussions about the future of predictive policing, the user interfaces, uh, the uh, augmented reality, and all the other things that comes up in discussions of, if it was just a kind of almost bullet point-like description of all those different technologies in, in a speculative future. If that Tom Cruise bit wasn't there, I don't think it would have had the effectiveness of being, whether again for good or bad, a discussion point in popular culture around design. So it's interesting, I was talking to a, a colleague of mine who's a couple of generations older than me, and we were saying, you know, do we think that the black mirror does enough to engage people critically in the discussions around the technology that it does? Because nowadays, if you're a speculative designer and you go to a client and you say, I do this, they go, oh, like black mirror, because everybody's seen black mirror. And then we were saying, is that a problem? That that's what people think it is? And then this, this colleague just says, yeah, but if you go back 20 years, there was just no critical discourse around technology. It just didn't exist. Technology was going to save us. Now, cinema, TV, um, discourses in the mainstream press are littered with data breaches, what if this technology is bad, Facebook ethics issues. It's really easy for us to stand around and go, this isn't good enough. And it's also not a good enough argument to be like, it's much better than it used to be. But there is definitely a now a popular sense of technological discourse. Fiction does reduce a lot of the complexities, but that's also why it works. And at a time where speculative designers themselves are questioning whether the practice is still even relevant as a vehicle for critical discussions, fictions might just be the best thing we have left. That is, maybe fictions that aren't cyberpunk. So yes, cyberpunk now is not the same thing as cyberpunk in the 80s. 
That is not to say it didn't have problems back then, but I'm not qualified to get into the whole Orientalism thing, nor does it fit into the scope of what I'm trying to do here. The point is, cyberpunk as a genre and cyberpunk as a subculture used to be defined by its critical dimension. A dimension that has, over the years, become more and more sidelined until there wasn't much left besides a cool future aesthetic. All subcultures are appropriated at some point. Once they become this no, no longer subcultures and they're just cultures, then yeah, parts of it are lost and found off. But then there's a bunch of other ex-punk cultures that have appeared in the meantime, like solar punk, you've got Afrofuturism, you've got all these other subcultures that have emerged to challenge the hegemony of futurism, which is what cyberpunk did at the time. Now, cyberpunk doesn't do that anymore because it is the hegemony of futurism. But that doesn't necessarily mean that cyberpunk as an aesthetic doesn't have value. So cyberpunk has become a nostalgic comfort blanket for having a set of aesthetic tools for talking about a future we're more scared of than excited about. And that, again, it's not so binary that there's no criticality in it. That in itself is as critical as the fact that in the early 2000s with the war on terror, we saw a massive spike in apocalypse cinema. Cyberpunk may have steered away from its roots, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that those of us looking for the kinds of themes that used to define it and the kinds of conversations that used to inspire may have to look elsewhere. Previously mentioned solarpunk and Afrofuturism would be a start. Genres that don't dwell on an 80s idea of the present as future, but instead look at where we are now and ask where to go from here. It helps that they have a tendency to center marginalized voices as well, something that an old relic like cyberpunk could learn from. It turns out that speculative fiction, science fiction, and stories in general can really thrive when given access to new perspectives. Who would have thought? As for speculative design, I'm going to have to disagree with my boy Francisco and say that the practice isn't bad just yet. Even on the corporate end of things, there are fantastic designers like J. Paul Neely who use speculative methods to help large organizations make comprehensive and actionable plans for meaningfully reducing their contributions to climate heating. It turns out that in spite of systemic barriers, there is a surprising number of people in these organizations that want to find alternative ways of doing things, and while design won't save the world on its own. God, no, I could make a whole video just talking about that nonsense. There are things it can do to help. And that is to say nothing of the value of speculative design for community organizing. Remember visioning, that exercise companies do to daydream about the kinds of products that will be lining their executives' pockets with cash a few years down the line. Turns out you can use that to do actually useful things. On a community level, visioning can be used as a means of better understanding the values and priorities of the actual people that live in a place. Then use that knowledge alongside quantitative data to put together local policy proposals aimed at tangibly improving lives, effectively letting people design better futures for themselves and their neighbors. So maybe speculative design isn't all that arcane or inaccessible at all. Designers just need to get better at sharing their toys. But this video is mainly supposed to be about fiction, so to make it up to all you gamers who have clicked on this expecting gaming content only to find yourselves watching an hour-long design lecture, I'm going to wrap up with a few games that I thought at least tried to live up to the values of speculative design. Games that made an honest effort to engage their audiences with critical discussions about the kinds of future we may be heading towards and, crucially, games that aren't cyberpunk. So here, let's look at some alternatives. Watch Dogs 2 is the only good game Ubisoft has released in the last decade. It's set in an ever so slightly futuristic version of San Francisco, full of the kinds of technology that, much like the connected devices and uninvited guests, isn't a far cry <laughs> get it, from what's already available today. It's a plausible extrapolation of the current trends in design and tech, complete with its own version of the Silicon Valley Big Five, and the game doesn't shy away from the kinds of critical conversations that its world-building invites, which just so happen to be some of the more relevant critical conversations about the role of technology in the current day. Look, Watch Dogs isn't perfect. It does occasionally flinch away from asking questions that could paint it a AAA shooter produced by a massive corporation now known mainly for sexually abusing its employees in a negative light. It has this truly bizarre tone shift late in the game and the open world stuff is at best superfluous and at worst actively makes the game worse. But it's also just about the most creative thing I have ever seen done within the suffocating constraints of the Ubisoft open world structure. It is, for the most part, 
impeccably well written. The main villain has an Eastern European name everyone utterly butchers when they say it. I feel your pain, Dushan. And, and this is what really sets it apart, it creates a unique kind of a non-violent power fantasy I haven't really seen anywhere else. It's a game that lets you use your sweet hacker skills to scam Martin Screlly out of that Wu-Tang Clan album that he bought the only copy of, and rescue Tom Cruise from the Church of Scientology. The game paints a world where the people running the show aren't exempt from the consequences of their actions and and all it takes for corrupt billionaires and politicians to be held accountable is to have evidence of their corruption be made public. And as naive as it often comes across as, I think that we all kind of need that. You should absolutely check it out if you can get your hands on a used copy. Do not give Ubisoft your money. Horizon Zero Dawn is a game I have mixed feelings on. I could probably make an entire separate thing about how frustratingly close to good a lot of its systems are before being undercut at every step with just awful design. About how Aloy is a dull character and I respect what they were trying to do with her but as it stands she's just hopelessly boring to watch. About how I wish that randomized loot, crafting and upgrade systems that only serve to add quality of life improvements that should have been there from the beginning would just fuck off forever. A lot of people like this one, but for me it was kind of a slog to actually play. Except then like halfway through the game gets good. Like real good. There's a particular string of missions in which you start exploring the history of this version of the world and delving into the fate of the civilization that had once destroyed it, and it's about as compelling as speculative fiction gets. Zero Dawn has one of the most fascinating, fully realized and ponyan fictional worlds I have ever seen, and to give away more than that would be a spoiler. I wish the game carried that momentum into its primary conflict involving a rogue AI and a cult, but for those few short hours and mid to late game, Horizon is something truly special. The Outer Worlds, not to be confused with The Outer Wilds, is a game I don't have all that much to say about. It's just okay, there's a lot of wasted potential as well as bits and pieces of exceptional writing when the game feels like it. The Outer Worlds is, if nothing else, a spirited attempt at creating a piece of anti-capitalist dystopian fiction without resorting to the aesthetic trappings of cyberpunk, and I feel like I have to commend it for that. It takes an interesting approach too, half speculation, half fantasy, having constructed an entire political system around a handful of large corporations and building the rest of its wealth from there. When it works, it really works, with one of the early quest lines weighing the human costs of supporting a small scale revolution against the much higher, but a lot more gradual cost of keeping the existing power structure in place. And then you leave that planet forever and your decision or its consequences never come up again. Ultimately it's all a bit on the nose and forgettable and the game never really explores its own themes and world building beyond the surface level, but it still gets an A for effort. I was disappointed, but it's still worth trying if you're really into the first person Fallout games and aren't too bothered by ambitious thematic concepts that end up being very style over substancy in practice. You should play The Outer Wilds though, it has nothing to do with anything, I just really liked it. And that's it, that's all I could think of off the top of my head. Man, none of those games are exactly ideal, are they? I just wish there was something else I could talk about here, like an option that does something truly different while not sacrificing the criticality. An option that's maybe a bit less punk, maybe a bit more disco. I wish there was a disco option. Oh man, this is going to be a two-parter, isn't it? Wait, no, there's still one thing. I bet you're wondering how I've managed to go through an entire video about Cyberpunk without once bringing up Cyberpunk 2077. It's simple, really. I've put links to some charities currently doing their best to help out LGBT people in Poland, along with a link containing information about the situation there. Actual lives are at stake, so please help out if you can. If not, spread the word. Alright, fine, I haven't played the game, I don't have a computer fast enough to run it, and it's not exactly known for playing nice with last-gen consoles. Also, I really don't want to. Okay, bye! Thank you for watching to the end for some reason. I would like to thank my patrons for having way more patience with me than I deserve. Special thanks to London Reject, who is donating $10 per video. If you would like to help me make more of these awful fakeouts and trick gamers into watching semi-educational content, the link to my Patreon page is down below. Patrons get early access to videos and can listen to the two full interviews with Tobias Revel that I have used here. Given how 
extremely infrequent my releases are for now. I only charge my patrons when I actually publish something, so you don't have to worry about pouring money into a dormant account. I would also like to thank Bando and Hamish Black for the voiceovers, links to their channels in the description, and my semi-willing director Claire for having way too good a time repeatedly hitting me in the face with a cushion. I've got something slightly less difficult to make prepared for the next time, so with a bit of luck, I might even be able to release the next thing in under a year. No promises.